everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're trying to outnumber you today. Um, welcome. I'm Maren Lead. I'm a senior advisor in the International Security Program here at CSIS. And uh, this is the fourth of what has been a series of events, a continuing series of events on um, the uh, joint multi-role tech demonstration and future vertical lift efforts uh, to get at the future of rotorcraft. And so uh, we started out with a broad conversation about why future vertical lift. And, um, and then in July, we had a session at which um, Dan Bailey, who's the uh, program director for both efforts, uh, participated, and that was focused on the air vehicle platform side of the future vertical left effort. And today, we're having the second half of that conversation about the mission system, mister, excuse me, mission system architecture, um, which is it's a lot easier to say the digital backbone of future vertical lift. Um, a couple of admin notes before we get started, if people could turn the ringers off on their phones, that would be much appreciated. When we get to Q&A, people will come around with microphones. If you could briefly identify yourself before asking your questions, that'd be great. We're going to um, march down the line here in hopefully relatively succinct fashion. Um, and then we'll try to, and then we'll have time to get into a broader conversation. Uh, people, as always, can email me questions if you're watching on the web, mlead, M-L-E-E-D, at CSIS.org. Um, and uh, otherwise, again, we'll have questions here. And um, let me also just say thanks to our sponsors. Uh, Bell and Textron have allowed us to do this uh, effort around future rotorcraft, so we're very grateful for their support. So again, uh, we're going to talk about the mission system architecture, the joint common architecture, um, which Dan Bailey characterized in July as the wrapper around future airborne capability environment or the face, the open architecture standard. Um, and so I'm sure we'll talk a lot about face today and about JCA, how JCA is advancing uh, the implementation of that standard. Um, and how uh, the FEL effort is in the process of implementing uh, its first of what a, a series of planned demonstrations uh, to to employ it. So we're going to start with uh, our OSD rep. This is Dr. Michael May. He's the acting director of Information Systems and Cybersecurity in the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, we have a we have a whole range of technical expertise. This is the physicist in the bunch. Uh, and prior to his time in OSD, he was an analyst at the Inf Institute for Defense Analyses. So he is going to start with uh, by talking about uh, um, sort of the the requirement for this and and uh, the problems that um, the mission systems and the and the joint common architecture in general are trying to solve for the department. Over to you. Thank you. Um, when we look at uh, complex systems. Uh, we realize that our, our current systems have become so connected, uh, interconnected, and built by many different teams that are in a distributed fashion that it becomes hard to track uh, all of the interfaces. It becomes hard to track uh, all of the different semantics, meaning the meanings of what did someone intend when they built one module and then they connected it to another, yet alone the physical interfaces or, say, the data interfaces. So, Take a step back and think in, and I, I'm, I'm, right now I'm thinking from a software perspective, and I, it also applies to the avionics and things as well, the, the electronics. But in these kind of missions, what are you trying to do? Okay. You're trying to, you have a set of requirements, a very high level set of requirements. And what you want at the end of the day is running code on a particular machine that meets those requirements. It sounds very simple to do. However, in our current system of developing things, one of the, there are a tremendous number of steps between the high-level requirements and the actual running code. And people have different names for them, specifications, high-level specifications, derived requirements. But really what it is, is from the high-level requirements, you get more and more detailed refinements and abstract, you lose your abstractions as you go down the list. And each one of those steps today is done in a very manual fashion. 
Okay, requirements are often kept on uh, in a spreadsheet, for example, or your specifications are. It tends to be an, a very error-prone process, right? And as you go from one down to the level below, right, as a different level of abstraction, there are uh, assumptions that are made. And sometimes those mismatched assumptions are those, if you make a wrong assumption about what the person at the other level intended, then you have a problem. And that can lead to mistakes. And so I'm sure that a lot of folks have heard of model-driven development. You know, and why is model driven development important to, or is a possibility to help attack this problem? Well, in a model driven de development environment, what you do is you actually record what the interfaces are, the semantics, and, you and that information is available then to anyone who wants to use it. So you have a shared understanding. Okay? More importantly, if you, once you get down to the very end of uh, the chain, we are actually going to produce code that runs on a machine. Okay? You ha we have methods today where we can formally verify the properties of that code. And so using formal methods would be great because we would give us something that's provably correct, right? Now there's a couple cautions there. I mean, the first off is a lot of some of our methods don't scale well to entire systems. So, you know, one would ha could imagine a condition where you formally prove various parts and then keep track of the contracts. Um, but the important thing I think about formal methods is that it changes the conversation. Currently, if, you, if you, you're either talking about interfaces, you say, oh, well, we had these many mismatches and these many fixes. Or if we're talking about software, you say, wow, today my team fixed seven bugs. Well, how many bugs were there? What's the ground truth, right? So if you can actually build something that's provably correct okay, and traceable up through the high-level requirements via these models, then what you've done is you've changed the conversation from being about bug finding to being about what did I mean about being correct, okay? I said it was correct by construction, but what, what, how did I determine what was correct? And at least then the conversation is about the requirement, okay? Um, these guys are gonna talk more about it, but you know, one of the things we do is we've got a lot of things, I noticed behind me there's you know, the AADL uh, logo that for the SAE standard is on, on the board there, or on the screen. Um, but things like that, those kind of tools, whether it's requirements planning tools, the, the architecture modeling tools, or even the formal methods gener uh, based auto code generation tools that are being developed in some places, DARPA has a hand in those, those are good things. And, and lastly, I would say that it might, if we're effective or successful in doing, developing these new paradigms, then will require probably new earned value measures uh, because, again, you're going to be correct by construction when you generate your code, right? And also I'd like to say that we have to look at our workforce because currently the folks out there in the world who program in the formal methods world, they, they use different languages. They don't use C++ and Java, right, to do formal methods. And the academic community that tends to use those are not the folks that we're often hiring um, with our bachelor's degrees they get to come out and work on our systems. The formal methods guys tend to be PhDs. And it's, it's, a, little, it's a little bit, I won't get into the history of that right now, but I, there's, it's an interesting story about how that schism happened. So anyway, I think that my last point there on workforce development and getting sure we have the right talent for a, a new paradigm is something uh, that should be considered. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so one of the people who's responsible for trying to get this get all these uh, levels to properly talk to each other is Robert Sweeney, whose uh, day job is as the lead avionics architect at, at NAV Air, Air Combat Elect Electronics Program Office, uh, PMA 209. But in the context of this discussion, he's also the chairman of the future of the FACE technical working group. Um, he has a background in software engineering. He's done that both for Wacko Collins and for uh, General Dynamics Information Technology. Um, he is a computer scientist by background, and uh, again, he's, he's deeply involved in executing the complicated architecture that you just described, so Robert. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to pile on a little bit more to the problem statement and maybe bring it up just a little bit uh, higher than, than what uh, Dr. May discussed. Um, so what is it wh that we're actually trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to acquire systems that allow us to innovate over time and to um, drive competition in the industrial base. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're able to sustain our aircraft, integrate new capabilities, and um, bring more capability to the warfighter itself? So common architectures for future rotorcraft. 
Um, we have to first invest in the infrastructure for the mission systems and the common architectures, and that's kind of where we're, we're going with FACE. Um, also, the emblem for host, which is a, a hardware infrastructure. And then uh, getting back to Dr. May's point of actually functionally decomposing our software and breaking it down into modules based off the requirements. So um, looking at the highest level, initial capabilities documents for our platforms, looking at the mission threads and the kill chains, understanding what the capabilities are on those aircraft, and then taking a model-based development approach uh, and looking at each of those requirements and breaking them down into functions that can actually be reused to make up the capabilities across platforms or families of systems. So the, the three pillars uh, of, of the common architecture uh, that we're currently looking at are, is the hardware infrastructure. How do we modularize the inside of, a, of mission computing? The software infrastructure, which is the future airborne capability environment. So um, that establishes the interfaces and then the semantic data model that Dr. May discussed. Uh, at least the building blocks for it, so you can implement uh, multiple uh, data models off of that infrastructure, but they, they are interoperable because they have a common semantic uh, definition underneath. And then the functionally decomposed uh, components. Uh, so that way we're actually defining what the components do, the functions and the capabilities, what the interface is to those components, the goes in and goes out is, and then what the behavior of those uh, interfaces are. And then based on that, we can then have um, companies or vendors compete on those components uh, and derive different algorithms with different performance characteristics, but yet still um, meet those uh, interfaces so that way we can reuse those components across multiple platforms or replace them, compete them, innovate on them. Um, next, we've got Dan Bailey, who's the program director for Joint Multi Role for the Joint Multi Role Program, uh, as well as a future vertical lift effort at Army Aviation Mis and Missile Research Development and Engineering Center. Um, Dan is a West Point grad, a career aviator, and then uh, became a test pilot and an acquisition professional. Um, he's spent his entire career uh, immersed in various rotorcraft platforms and is now uh, leading the FEL effort writ large. So um, I think you're going to give us an update on where we are in the evolution of joint common architecture and before we get to the people who are actually Absolutely. doing the work. So first I'd like to say for those of us who come from the uh, southern part of the U.S. this morning, we thank you for warming it up for us. Um, and I always thank you, for Dr. Lee, for uh, hosting us. So, uh, so you understand the problem. I think we talked about the problem. If you didn't understand the problem before, you certainly heard some, uh, some aspects of the problem here. So what's different, what's new, and what are we doing under the joint multi-role, which is a science and technology effort, obviously, to, uh, to feed future vertical lift? Well, um, <clears throat> the problem is not new. We've learned over time technical aspects of, of how to deal with the problem, but there's more to dealing with the problem than just the technical aspects of it, right? The tools and the standards are one thing, but uh, as Lieutenant General Williamson, the uh, MILDEP to the Army Executive or Acquisition Executive said a couple of weeks ago at the Open Architecture Symposium here in D.C. that uh, you, can, you can have standards, but implementing those standards through the acquisition process is another story. So what's, what's different, if you will, is we've learned over time, for several decades we've been after this, right? We continue to go after it and, and, and we struggle because it takes multiple programs over long periods of time to learn the different business practices and the different elements of the process to implement those standards and, and maintain that uh, backbone so that we can ultimately get the efficiencies that Rob talked about. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we move forward from here? Well, just like on the air vehicle platform side of the Joint Multi-World Tech Demonstrator, we're trying to do the same thing on the mission system architecture side. We're not, we're not developing the mission system architecture per se for future vertical lift. It's way too early to do that. But we are looking at the processes, the tools, the standards, and we're going to do demonstrations of that over time. So if you bring up the next chart for me, you'll see right here, this is, this is the definition of the mission system architecture demonstration under the joint multi role tech demonstrator. We're looking to provide guidance and infrastructure necessary for FEL. Implement that 
affordable, timely, and effective architecture across the family of future vertical lift systems that's enduring, efficient, and effective for the long term. Well, there's more to it than just the standards and the tools. Those are absolutely the foundations. But now we have to determine across the family of aircraft and across the family of program managers, various entities that provide uh, commodities to us, how do we implement that globally from an acquisition process perspective? So that's what we're focused on. We're, you know, the business practices as well as the technology have advanced to the point where we think we now can start to implement this effectively and that's what we're looking to demonstrate. Um, so we're not doing, uh, we're not developing the mission equipment package. We're not developing the architecture per se. We're trying to implement demonstrations over time to learn. So learn as we go. And that's what we're doing uh, incrementally for the next five years. Um, at the same conference, uh, Vice Admiral Dunaway, who's the Nav Air Commander, said this. He said, uh, system acquirers, uh, acquirers need to think about everything they're buying as a part of a system of systems as opposed to a stovepipe component that moves through the acquisition process with its own agenda. So how do you, how do you broadly change our processes, our practices, our culture in some ways so that everyone from the acquisition community is implementing that uh, globally, if you will, so that we have the ability to integrate those standards and those tools uh, over, the, over the long haul. That's really what we're all about. So if you go to the next chart there, this is the MSAD schedule. Uh, align with the air vehicle piece, we're looking at the configurations for the air vehicle, the, the, the flying backbone, this is the architectural backbone. There's many technologies that are advancing, uh, and as we have done in the past, right, we've learned that now we're going to implement a fiber channel data bus, as an example. We have to learn through that program what that means to us from an architecture perspective, what it means to us from a modeling and tools perspective. We don't want to learn in the first iteration of FEL and then every other subsequent FEL change it. We want to learn before we actually implement the first one. So that's what this science and technology program actually gives us the ability to do. In a shorter period of time with obviously you know, fewer resources required, we can do incremental in, uh, uh, demonstrations of this and learn as we go so that the first future vertical lift program of record has what we need in terms of culture, process, standards, tools to implement it at the beginning. So if you look at the schedule here, um, to do that, we've got to first know what do we think mission equipment in the future is going to look like? What do we think the technologies are going to be required in the future? So we did what was called a mission systems effectiveness trades and analysis. We went out to industry, had all the industry partners who are subject matter experts in their fields uh, do the studies. Where are we today? What are the problems of today? And where we think the technology is going in the future? We learned some critical things. We learned that fiber is probably the way of the future. We learned that wireless data buses are probably the way of the future. We learned that multi-core processing and distributed processing is the way of the future. Um, you know, uh, multiple layer security requirements are a part of the future. So how does all of that affect the architecture and the standards and the tools? So now that we understand that, we can begin to think about that now before we actually finalize the standard, implement the standard, and ultimately build in an acquisition process that that stovepipes us, uh, that's what we, not, we don't want to do. So we did that, we turned that into uh, what we thought was the first iteration of the demonstration, and we, uh, if you look on the bottom left, are in the process of execution of what's called the Joint Common Architecture Demonstration, that bottom left, uh, as well as the Architectural Center Virtual Integration Process, which is the model-based tool process that Dr. May talked about. We, that's, the, that's an overshadowing part of this. So the demonstration first is a concept, it's a proof of concept. Are we on the right path, right? Learn as we go, as I said. And then from that, we will turn that into uh, several iterations, as you see there, called architectural implement implementation process demonstration. Key, right? The key word in all of that is implementation. Go back to what I said at the very beginning. Lieutenant General Williamson said you can have standards, but implementing those standards is the difficult part that we run into over time. So how are we gonna implement it, right? Program manager guidance, memos, standards, policies for the, for the program managers, those will have to be enforced, implemented across uh, our fleet, if you will, if we're going to get after the synergies we're looking for. And ultimately, we look at, uh, we're looking at doing a capstone demonstration at the end in this, a large instantiation of architectures that won't necessarily be the architectures, but they certainly could be the, the first of many to come. So, uh, so I say all that to... to, to actually introduce, and I know Dr. Leeds going to introduce 
Uh, to my left are, are two contractors for the Joint Common Architecture Demonstration, uh, a team of Boeing and Sikorsky and Honeywell, and they're going to talk to you about what they're doing specifically. But, but I'll finish with one more quote from Lieutenant General Williamson, and it says, there's still a requirement for leadership and management. You can put out as many standards as you want, but you still have to make sure you understand how those are implemented within your program. So what is Joint Multi-Role Tech Demonstrator Mission System Architecture Demo all about? It's about the implementation of all the work that's going on outside of this so that we understand the process, the implementation tools, the standard, the culture that's required to get after that synergy in the future. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so Dr. Tom Dubois is the Chief Systems Architect at Sikorsky Boeing uh, JMR Helicopter Future Vertical Lift Program. He's also the co-principal investigator of the Sikorsky Boeing Joint Common Architecture Demonstration Program, um, which Dan was just talking about. He's got 27 years at Boeing uh, in developing advanced mission systems for various rotorcraft programs. So uh, Tom, if you could talk a little bit about what uh, the Sikorsky Boeing team is doing and um, what what it takes to actually execute what they these all our previous panelists have described. Yes, for sure. Uh, and yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to be here. Thank you. And I also like to um, uh, recognize my co-principal investigator, Bill Kinahan, uh, works for Sikorsky and unfortunately couldn't make it here today. But on to um, what we're doing on joint common architecture demonstration. Um, we have been very much involved, both of our companies, um, uh, jointly and independently with the FACE uh, consortium, helping uh, write the joint common architecture and even doing some R&D studies in model-based design, uh, at least from a research perspective and maybe some applications in that area. So when we saw JCA demo appear as an opportunity, we thought that was a great chance to really try out these new technologies in earnest, following up from what uh, Dan said, said earlier. And so basically for the project, we were given a data model, as mentioned before, a very few number of performance requirements, which were actually the behavioral aspects, as was discussed earlier as well, and set, told to be conformant to the FACE standard. And then go build an app, if you will, um, the Fusion app in this case, and, and a piece of software that can be used to test it. And the results would go through a blind test. So we have no idea what this was going to, to run on, and, and it would run these things at the uh, Army lab in Huntsville and also subject it to the uh, phase conformance verification process. Well, throughout this, it was most important, and this is the learning part of it, um, to use the government-provided uh, tools referred to as the JCA ecosystem and collect lessons learned. And um, there were a few things we learned on the way, and they were very quickly changed. Much credit to Rob Sweeney for making a couple of those things happen, because this is, this is definitely uh, a learning process. And by the way, all this work had to be done in four months. So you had to write a Fusion app, uh, conform to a new standard, and you basically had four months to do the job and hand it off uh, to a test group that, and it'd be a blind test. You were not given any information about what this was going to run on, what operating system it was going to use, what hardware it was going to use. So to me, it was a great experiment. Um, when I saw the description of what was necessary, I thought, this is a really cool uh, experiment. This is going to be a big challenge. Let's see, let's see what we can do to make this work. So we also had some ideas of our own, too. Um, one of them is, and it's mentioned before here, is, is uh, reuse. So what we did for our um, part of our demonstration, and there's the picture right there, uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, we grabbed a piece of uh, software that already did fusion. Uh, it's been fielded on the AWACS aircraft, P-8 aircraft, and a few other aircraft. We basically ripped it out, created a wrapper, using some terms we heard earlier, around it to conform to the face standard. So. Basically, it aligns the I.O. So we'd expected I.O. in one form, and using the data model that they gave us, used I.O. in a different form. So the old way was ICDs, the new way is data models, and maybe if we can get to the point of behavioral models as well. So um, truly a different way of building systems. So um, at the same time, we also had to build a, um, a test software to prove that this thing worked, it met its requirements, and so we actually, uh, and, and a lot of this is where some of Bill Kinahan's uh, innovation came in, we decided to use the same standard, the same face standard, to build uh, the tool that would test the, um, the, the, the Fusion software. So it was using the same data model. The only thing that made it different is we used another tool to auto-generate a lot of the test cases that would um, uh, automatically run on it. So 
uh, in addition, so that was basically what the basic work was. We handed, we, and actually we finished it in three months instead of four, which was pretty cool. The last uh, month was all about uh, tweaking it a little bit and creating the artifacts uh, that were necessary to support the verification process. Everything was handed over and uh, the Army's working with it right now. So um, in addition to the basic program, uh, if you look in the uh, upper right and lower left, we actually volunteered a couple extra tasks that we thought were perfectly in line with what the government's objectives were. Uh, the first one uh, was to, uh, a, a, which is which a task to host the same app on a bunch of different operating environments. So we had the blind test, so we, we went to do our own blind test. So we came up with three other um, systems that we would try to run this uh, Fusion application on. That's the one that's shown in the lower left. Uh, one of them is uh, an architecture that is the same hardware architecture that's on the Apache uh, aircraft. Um, another one is on the uh, Sikorsky uh, Raider aircraft. And a third one is, is, was on a, uh, a future-oriented uh, architecture that uh, Boeing calls Phantom Fusion. So we wanted to cover uh, the legacy, the emergent, and the future, uh, all with the same basic application. And to what extent does the software really need to change to get it to run from one to the other? And to the credit of the standard that Rob's been championing here, um, very few changes need to be made. They're done at what's called the transport layer, very low level. So you can think of this as trying to write an app without chart changing hardly any of the software and have it automatically run on your iPhone, your Windows phone and, and your Droid uh, with the minimalist of, uh, of changes. So I thought that was a really good task. We basically just began that task, but we have transport services for them and we've really kind of started it already. We couldn't really start it fully until we had the code <laughs> to work with. So, so we couldn't start before month three. Um, the, the upper right hand corner is the second task. Um, this is a new app, and, and, and we wanted to learn how to build data models ourselves, too, as, as an integrator. And, um, and, and we, we, we also wanted to explore to what extent this standard can be pushed into touching the flight controls. So um, we created a new application called uh, for, Formation Flight. Um, we chose it because we, a, a lot of our smart people are thinking that there has to be a much uh, tighter integration between... Uh, the flight controls and traditional mission systems to accomplish some of the um, really visionary requirements that we expect to see in JMRFVL, particularly um, in the areas of autonomy, optionally piloted vehicle, cognitive decision aiding. Um, these are really hard requirements to meet uh, to, to achieve their full vision. And so we think by having a, a tighter integration between those disciplines that will be able to do that. So the question now was for us on this additional task was, could you build an app that conforms to those standards and um, all of the overhead that comes with being open, uh, conforming to that, will it create uh, time delays and latencies that would make it impossible to meet some of those requirements? And so we actually were able to start that one from the very beginning because it was a brand new application using uh, the same standard. and. Uh, so far, our results are showing us that the standard does not get in the way of this at all. Now, we're fairly certain we can't push it down to the innermost uh, uh, flight control loops, but, but we can do outer loop type functionality, um, some interesting functions like integrated fire and flight control and other types of uh, apps that uh, interact with the vehicle and become a complex cyber system that's flying and not have to worry too much about the architectural details and the separation. So some of the future work in the area of control laws and other types of um, uh, behavioral modeling uh, pushed up a level, like Dr. May was talking about, is all related to this kind of a thing. And, and we think the architecture concepts are going to evolve um, over time to make that happen. So uh, in summary, uh, I can say that, you know, I started this, I was, you know, like most engineers, were a bit skeptical. We've had histories of other standards like JIWIG and things like that. And so when you go into these things, you wonder where the, where the problems might be and things like that. But I can tell you from, from my experience as a PI on this one project, uh, I'm a believer now. I, I think we can make these things um, happen. Uh, the doubts and uncertainty of its possibility are gone. It becomes, it's starting to look like more like a maturation. Uh, rather than an a exploration, if you will. So um, the, one, the next big challenge, as um, Dan mentioned, uh, is the integration aspect of it. And 
And that's also what makes app development for aviation systems a lot different from app development for mobile computing is all the interactions that occur between the applications to make an aircraft fly. And if we push into touching the flight controls a bit more, that even complicates it in ways we haven't thought of. So, so the integration part is going to be um, a real challenge in that area, but also believe that that's what's necessary to uh, achieve this family of systems type vision and have it work on a lot of different aircraft, be independent of the underlying operating environment and hardware and things of that sort. Um, one thing also that I, and, and, and the DOD did kick off a, a, an impact study on airworthiness that's very much related to this because to make these kinds of new concepts work, you have to be able to get it to, you know, to be safe to fly in the end. And to do that, there's probably going to be some needed changes to the airworthiness process. And I know the DOD has recognized it. I think these are the technologies that are, that are driving it to be able to meet these really ambitious future requirements. And it's going to take something like that to make FVL as a family of system a real, a real program that the warfighter has to have. So there's also the, the airworthiness aspect of it as well, as well that needs to be addressed. So, so um, ultimately, um, it was a, it, it's a good, good experience. We've got a few more months left to finish it up. We're going through the verification right now, but um, it's be more one of uh, we'll get the job done. So, uh, and it's been a pleasure to work on it. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so now, Joseph Ritter's here as the representative of Honeywell, the other team working on the tech, uh, the architecture demonstration. He's the senior technology manager at Honeywell's Advanced Technology Organization. Again, the program manager for Honeywell's JMR uh, Joint Common Arch Architecture Demo. Um, he also has had a variety of positions over 35 years, both in management and in uh, actual develop and in development and integration of technology for avionics and ground vehicle electronics for uh, missiles, fixed and rotary wing aircraft, uh, artillery, and a variety of other systems. So uh, just over to you. So again, thanks for uh, CSIS hosting the discussion today and for AATD to allow Honeywell to perform on the, on the demo program. I think the demo program, it was a great opportunity, as was said earlier, to learn by doing. And, and that, that is, hopefully we'll continue these efforts because it, it uh, really, we've learned a lot, I think both on the industry side and on the government side through this activity. Um, we executed really the same technical program that, that uh, Boeing Sikorsky executed, so I'm not gonna go into those details per se. Um, I think what's interesting here is we what we demonstrated and validated was more than conformance to the standard. It really was this concept of the ecosystem and how does everything work through the system. So we were asked to publish in the FACE library we are um, distributing through the verification authority and verifying that that process and that organization is being stood up and, and, and working as well. And so that's been, been very beneficial. Um, I think the, the, what we really achieved here in this first you know, exercise is, is getting a glimpse, can we do procurement against a model-based um, methodology? And I think that at least initial, um, you know, report out is yeah we can. It's 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 going to be achievable. There's there's stumbling blocks. I mean we have to be um, prescriptive to the data model and make sure we all understand specifically what the data model is and and accuracy to that. Just like any um, text-based requirement, it's got to be very accurate and very um, pers you know. The perspective has to be correct, but I think that we've seen, yeah, this 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 is going to work. Um, let's see. Again, I think um, you know, from a, a positive note, we we all learn very rapidly, both on the government side, both on the industry side, um, the the procurement model, um, data model approach is going to work. Um, we were pleasantly surprised by some of the tool interaction. We had actually um, budgeted effort to develop some speci specificity around transport services, and actually the tools provided that for us. That was a very pleasant surprise, made, made our effort, you know, quite a bit easier. Um, there, you know, there's, there are things that both sides are going to have to learn. I think there was, um, you know, around the this, this specifics. Um, I think there was some, there's learning to be done on both the government and industry side around, you know, the 653 model, around uh, specific actions around the, the actual data model, but again, 
this has been a, a good experience, um, good, a good learning experience on both sides. And, you know, as far as proving will a data model approach work, I think we've, we've done that. Thanks. Well, we wanted to wrap up the discussion today uh, with the customer perspective. So to do that, we have uh, Commander Will Hargers. He's His day job is as the Air Vehicle Systems and Production Team Lead uh, for the MH60 RNS models. Um, and his uh, other hat is as the FEL Common Systems Team Lead. Uh, also an aviator test pilot, multiple deployments in support of operations both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, graduate of the Naval Academy with a mechanical engineering background, and a master's in techno uh, technology management from Johns Hopkins. So, uh, Commander Hargers, how does this sound to you? I'm, bu I'm buying it. Right? Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, of everything that this composite team and, and everybody else associated with the JCA, the host, the FACE efforts, all the consortium members, uh, everything that I see coming out of this um, just shows goodness down the road, not only for future vertical lift, right, as the context for the discussion, and, and, uh, but for our in-service platforms uh, as well. Um, I'd like to offer my thanks for the opportunity to speak, um, not only to, to CSIS and, and you, Dr. Lead, but also to the audience members who took some time today to come join the discussion. I think that the, the, the breadth of folks that we have here, both in and out of uniform, is telling in that there's interest in the problem and also in the solution. And I, I think that that interest only needs to grow. Um, we gotta solve, we, we, we've gotta solve the, not only this problem, but the future vertical lift problem in general. Um, how do we recapitalize the loss of thousands of aircraft over the next couple of decades as their service life comes to an end? Uh, it's a huge challenge. I think we're up to it, but uh, it's going to take some significant alignment between uh, government industry partners, um, the s and efforts, uh, a seamless transition to, to the actual implementation recap of those capabilities. Uh, as I mentioned, I think future vertical lift, the s and activities, the MSAT efforts, the JMRTD um, air vehicle efforts uh, provide the perfect context for this discussion, as do a lot of our other future acquisition efforts. You look at, uh, you know, we got FAXX coming down the road. Uh, that's a Navy perspective. Um, we've got ships, submarines. Everybody can benefit from um, advancement in our mission systems and in development of our interfaces in uh, enabling, as Rob mentioned, um, enabling competition, enabling rapid integration. Uh, it shouldn't take me two years to defeat the threat, right? If, if I've got, if somebody else has developed the solution uh, it shouldn't take me two years to contract for, design for, integrate, and field that solution. I mean, we've got to be able to do it faster and more furiously. Um, this is something we can do now, as evidenced by the, the fact that the, the JCA team is stepping off and, uh, and, and doing a great job in their functional decomposition. That's the first step. We've got to define those boundary layers. Right? I step into a cockpit, and my collective goes up and down, and my cyclic goes left and right now the Puma's pedals are going the wrong direction. But it's standard, right? My developers across industry, my government partners, they should be operating within the same common context. And I think that functional decomposition is gonna provide that for us. And it's, it's, it's vital that we get it right, that everybody buys in, everybody's aligned, and um, that we move forward and implement those that we don't diverge. Um, I mentioned that this applies to in-service platforms. Uh, I've got production aircraft. I'm going to field my last year a year from next month. And that aircraft's backbone, its, it's computing power is going to be obsolete in not too long. I've got to be able to leverage what I've got. It's got to be cost effective, and I've got to keep that aircraft relevant. I think efforts like the, the, the host effort, the hardware side, the JCA, uh, functional decomposition and the path to the mission systems demo, uh, the work that the FACE guys are doing and through their uh, consortium, the industry partners, I think it's vital to the in-service platforms as well. I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, about six years ago, I was the, the uh, avionic systems project officer for the H-53, and we were trying to field a material solution that met uh, CENTCOM Blue Force tracker requirements. Uh, I had a fantastic knee board, did everything that I needed it to do. My guys could see uh, incoming data. We could provide position location for our aircraft and met all the requirements, however, no standard 704 application wasn't standard across the services. I had a knee board that wasn't qualified to navigate standards. So I went to go field that, get through my setter process, 
It didn't work. Um, waivers weren't generally uh, approved. So it complicated the acquisitions process. If the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force can agree on a standard application of that handbook, of that standard, right, I can field an open system that provides capability to warfighter. I can get it out there faster and make those guys a lot more effective as they're facing the enemy. I think the alignment part is critical, and I think we're doing a very good job. Uh, an example is that uh, the Software Engineering Directorate is the first verification authority for the FACE um, standard. Right. Did I get that right, Rob? Yeah. Um, that shows perfect partnership, particularly as it applies to today's discussion. And I think it's critical that we continue down that path. Uh, we don't stay aligned. We're going we're gonna to fail from the get-go. Right? We can have common even identical requirements for the air vehicle for the mission systems. If we don't apply it across the services the same way, I think we'll run into um, the cost growth that has plagued previous joint common programs. We've got to avoid that kind of problem. Um, I think I'll, I'll close with uh, emphasis that the time is now. Uh, we've got to resource these kinds of efforts. The services have to buy in. Um, we're not too early. Right? And, uh, the architecture is a key part that we can do now to start solving this problem so we can field some, some relevant, um, some technically effective aircraft come 2035 when we've got to get them out there. So again, thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to the discussion today. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let me kick off the questioning just briefly. Uh, Dr. May, I wanted to get back to a point that you raised about about workforce and um, some of the implications of workforce requirements uh, of these developments. And I want to specifically ask uh, Sikorsky and, and uh, Honeywell whether what you all see as, um, and, then, and then maybe get the government perspective as well, um, do you feel like on the government side um, the workforce is properly aligned to carry this effort forward, not, not in its specific instantiation and this program, because obviously it is, but um, in, in general, more broadly, and then on industry's side, um, do you all see a need for a different workforce, and, and if, is that a concern? So. Um, why don't we start with the government side, if any, one of you wants to jump on that. I think it was more directed And then, the well, I want to ask on the, what the government workforce implications are, and also then what the industry implications are. So it, currently today, um, we're working towards bringing our workforce up to speed on model-driven development, uh, development of the software standards, um, decomposing our software, uh, looking at uh, formal methods. These are all things that we're looking at doing. Uh, we're bringing um, new engineers in through development programs. Uh, putting them in the right places on the right program so that way they come up to speed and then deploying them out to other program offices in order to uh, bring the rest of the, the workforce up to speed. So I, I think we are positioning ourselves. I wouldn't say we're there today, um, but we are getting there. I'll add to it. So, um, you know, we're, we're not on the government side uh, always as lucky to have someone who's been on the industry side that's done this for real. Um, we, we have uh, probably few of those, and we have a lot of acquisition professionals. So another piece that came out of uh, two, week ago, two weeks ago, the architecture uh, uh, symposium, there was a statement that says, um, uh, what we're looking for is what we do in our process so that we ask the right questions early in the process so that we're not surprised at the end, right? So back to that, that's a, that's a culture thing, that's, a, that's an education thing. And, um, and we're not there today, for sure. Uh, but the, the key part of this is, is we realize it. And, um, and so under the, under the effort through the Vertical Lift Consortium, we are actually in partnership, Army, Navy together, in partnership through the Joint Common Architecture and the JMR efforts. We're, we're tasking the Vertical Lift Consortium to provide us SMEs. Um, I think it's two per task, right, function. So we're doing functional decomposition on that. We're, we're asking for two SMEs, can't be the same companies, for periods of time to help 
basically direct us in, in action, execution of that. And then on our government side, we're, 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 the, we're actually coding it and working that in the standard, but uh, in the architecture uh, instantiation, but it's really the industry that's teaching us and guiding us, if you will. So, so we're heading down that path that Rob's talking about. Uh, we're not there today, but we're, we'll certainly be there on our timeline required. Well, yes, actually, uh, we have some interesting observations in this category from our experience working on the JCA demo, pro demo project for, as an example. Um, we talked about the workforce and the skill base. Um, one thing when, it, when you're dealing with data models, um, for those who have more experience in programming, there's a tendency of writing data models as computer structures. You don't want to do that. Um, that's not the right way. You got to think of data models as, as kind of functional, more object-based view of what's going on, representing more uh, here's are this, here are the elements of the system and here's how they interact, not here's a structure that has this particular scalar data type or something along those lines. What, I, what we found is uh, one of the um, people working on our project who was able to pick up data modeling the quickest was one of our youngest um, engineers, as a matter of fact. So he wasn't uh, biased by a history of doing a lot of programming in different ways. So um, I think uh, the, the schools, and, and actually because of the way the technologies are advancing and the kind of tools that they're using there and doing more um, uh, library, they're building up code more from libraries and existing libraries and existing code, it becomes more of a building block approach to programming versus first principles, structural decomposition way of looking at a problem. So um, I think that one is, is a case of, I think the universities are starting to do the right thing and we need to keep an eye out uh, for them. And maybe those who have a little bit more experience need to move into more of the other aspects of the behavioral modeling and trying to do the advanced programming that might be associated with trying to make those kinds of things happen. So uh, I think to make this model work, there has to be that workforce-like transition. I'm not seeing any significant gaps because I think in a sense, people are moving towards that already, which is another reason why I like this basic approach. I think Honeywell perspective is similar. Um, my PI worked on the data model for FACE and so really understood it quite well. But some of our developers struggled actually um, with, the, with the concept of the data model and dealing with the data model. And the learning curve was a little steeper there. So, so that is, you know, feedback for us to go back and, and make sure we're looking at our talent and, and growing people in this way. I do agree that um, coming out of the universities, it's, it's more appropriate. People have better experience um, in that realm or aren't as biased from having, you know, years of developing in, in, a, in a different methodology. So um, I don't think it's... Um, you know, it's not out of bounds for us, but it is something to pay attention to at this point. Okay. Can I add? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think one other aspect, um, just to touch on the cultural changes and the acquisition professionals, is we do have um, our current culture in, in the DOD is uh, quite heavily focused on engineering as acquisition. Um, so changing the mindset and then changing the mindset of folks that have been there that have lived through some of the open architecture experiences, um, having them uh, be able to accept that there's a, a change coming uh, is a little bit more difficult. So uh, really bringing in new engineers, new talent, I, I think, um, is helping that out. And then as it, it uh, shows some success stories, like I'm very glad to hear um, the success story that, you're, that you guys are experiencing, those success stories help with the cultural change within the DOD. I'm going to pile on one more. So <laughs> I, I'm going to actually maybe turn this over to Dr. Go We're just a, doing one question yeah, he's, today. <laughs> he's, a, he's a subject matter expert on this. But, you know, Savvy, as you see up there, is actually a commercially based enterprise. And so the other aspect to, to this is, is DOD is reaching out, if you will. DOD has its own version now of what commercial industry had started uh, years ago. And so certainly the, you know, the, the industry partners that are out here um, have commercial sides and DOD sides, and sometimes they cross and sometimes they don't. But if you will, you know, AVCIP or ACVIP is the DOD version, if you will, of the, what the savvy group has been working on for years. So we're now getting, we're getting the cross-pollinization from commercial side into DOD a little bit more than we have in the past. Real quick, I'll just add on that. Uh, I, I think, I, I'm, I'm hearing that when it comes to data models, 
uh, it's kind of a low-hanging fruit. That's a good place to uh, train people. Um, but earlier on, we were having a discussion, and we were talking about behavioral models, okay? And when we get to verifying whether the behavior is correct, we start getting into, again, kind of the formal methods area. Uh, and, and, and that's really, when I, when, I, when I made the comment, I'm kind of looking farther down the line even than the data models. And thinking about, you know, well, there's two communities, and the formal methods community tends to be, again, PhD folks, right? And they program in different languages than the folks who program, in, they don't program in C++ and Java to do formal methods. And so, to, so low hanging fruit, I think we're probably in, the, in a good spot. I think farther on down the line, when we talk about provably correct behavior, that's where we will have to try to find more cross-disciplinary folks. Okay, uh, as proof of concept that emailing me questions does actually work, uh, I'm gonna offer one that I got my email. Uh, it's from an, an Australian Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Charlie Barton, who's the uh, aviation liaison officer at the uh, Aviation Center of Excellence. Um, I'm not gonna try the accent, you're in luck. It's really two questions, quick ones. Uh, will the proposed common architecture include data link and data sharing access, uh, or uh, data sharing across all four services? And then the second question is, uh, will DOD develop an agreed common data architecture so FVL can transition from the, from the littoral to the land via high altitude without a loss of information or battle space compatibility? So those are very, probably specific requirement kind of questions, and I would say that we haven't defined this full set of requirements at this point, but uh, you know, I think fundamentally or theoretically maybe that kind of connectivity is certainly what we're after, uh, both from a, from a sea to a land perspective, but more importantly across the services, whether, whether it's uh, sharing data or whether it's um, you know, a, common, a common capability of data collection that we can, we can ultimately leverage in whatever way the service needs to, to leverage it. There's probably you know, we, we maintain aircraft very similarly, but yet we, we don't necessarily capture the data very similarly today. So there's opportunities there. Those def requirements haven't been defined specifically, but, um, but anything we can dream up today, we're looking at building architecture to accommodate that. I can add to too, yes. Um, uh, I have some background in doing this networking kind of thing too with some, some previous experience. So from our perspective, where we're at now though, it, once those requirements are defined, it's an application for us. We write the application, hopefully we only write it once and it can be used on all the different aircraft. So once I guess this kind of standard gets defined probably at the DOD level, um, and then gets percolated down to the services, uh, it becomes one application, uh, it becomes one data model that implements whatever that protocol happens to be to implement uh, how you're going to be uh, linking your data or whatever, uh, if it's a video as well, there could be other standards for that. If you need services on the way to do those kinds of things, these are things that should only be done once. And this, this, this approach that we're looking at now is designed to try and make it happen that way. So, though we don't have the answer today, um, uh, we have an approach that once the requirement gets defined, it'll be really easy to get the answer. There'll be an app for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me open up to audience questions. Again, if you could raise your hand, people come around with a mic. If you could state who you are quickly and get your question. So, Sydney from Surprise. First question from Sydney. Sydney Friedberg, uh, Breaking Defense and Humanities major. Uh, <laughs> So put this in, in layman's terms, and I know you guys have to spin, slow your brains down by like a factor of 100 now. Uh, how does this approach to software, this model-based approach, this, these formal standards, uh, sort of this, I guess there's almost like you know, measure twice, cut once, how does it prevent the kind of disasters you got with future combat systems, SOSCO software, which I don't think ever worked, uh, where again you had trying to do one system across many different pieces of hardware. How does it prevent the problems you've had with you know the last joint uh, aircraft? I believe even uh, the commander mentioned you know alluded to this uh, JSF, where they've had a lot of trouble getting the software for, for example, the Marines uh, where it needs to be on schedule. In terms of you know getting the product to the military consumer functioning and on schedule, what, what does this approach do better 
than the way J JSF, FCS, and other projects have done in the past. Better than FCS is not a high standard, of course. I guess I'll take a first crack at it and then everybody else can pile on. Um, so I think the approach that, that we've taken is we haven't uh, tied our standards or um, the methods to a specific platform or specific requirement or technology. So we have really looked at, so, so the FACE standard, um, the, the, uh, the JCA standard, it's not specific to future vertical lift. So um, the JCA standard, the functional decomposition, those functions can be used to uh, create different capabilities across different platforms. The FACE standard itself, um, it's not specific to even aviation, even though aviation's in the name. Uh, it's, a, it's more of a, a software standard. So we've really tried to pull ourselves uh, out of the implementation itself and look at what's the best, best methods uh, and how, or best practices that commercial industry has used to establish a product line. Um, so I think uh, previously in our, in our endeavors, uh, such as um, FCS, we've really uh, tied ourselves to a requirement and an implement, specific implementation. Um, and I think that's probably where we're taking a different approach. And also uh, looking at what the business aspects are so that way we get uh, a broader scope of industry looking at the problem um, away from the actual acquisition process. So in other words, you're not, you're not making it already specifically for one requirement to say you're making it so it can be widely applicable uh, and whatever the requirements end up being because you don't know them yet. That's correct. Yeah, and I think I, I can definitely add to this one too since I actually worked on FCS and was, was part of, well, in, indirectly. Um, but I will say that Tosco did work. I actually took it to Australia with me and showed how I could use it to connect the Chinook to a Scan Eagle and do some maritime patrol. Um, but so it, it did work. The problem was one of broad acceptance. Now, getting at the heart of uh, what the difference is between uh, Sasco and what FACE is trying to do, it comes down to transport services. Uh, Sasco was its own design, in a sense, on how you handled things at that middleware level. I hope I'm not going too deep for the audience, but, but um, so Sasco was the middleware. So you would write your application, it went through Sasco, and then it went to the, the hardware that was underneath it. What FACE has done differently is you write your software, you use a common transport service, and then whatever the underlying operating system and hardware is will have its own, call it, plug-in for that transport service. So you don't have to change the things at the application level. When you wrote software for FCS, you always had to use the Sasco middleware to, to take advantage of all those features. Here, you don't really have to do that. The standard's are more open, and things go down to the transport service level. So all you need to do is comply the standard right to the transport service level, and then everything below that can be operating system, handle the operating system, handle the underlying hardware. So that effectively was the key technical difference at the heart of what made Sasco different from this base standard. And um, having worked both and seen one not maybe be as successful as one would have hoped and one that seems to be going to be successful, you know, I, I do have that kind of background. So I did work both. Well, it's, it's allowing there to be lots of middlemen lots versus of, lots of providers as long as they comply with that transport. That's layer, right. right. You, that you, you, write you comply the with the interface yes. and yeah. everybody can play, right? So in theory, you get the best of the product for that capability. Uh, also wanted to clarify my JSF comments, right? Strictly used as an example of cost growth and not necessarily as uh, technical challenges. Every new program has technical challenges. Um, and this one certainly will uh, as well, right? You don't, you don't fully realize the, uh, the depth and breadth of the challenge until you dig in and, and start to do it. But I think what Rob and his team and the JCA team and, and, and those guys are doing is really just um, enabling that development, enabling that innovation. They talked about some of the, the technical applications, and I really wish Rob had a chart, his, his, uh, his face chart that shows um, uh, closed systems as they migrate to open systems for development and as it applies to uh, smartphones, right? Um, you look at Android as being a fully open system, and anybody that's got a capability that they want to bring to that fight, well, they can play because they know what that standard is, they know what the interface is, and they can do their level best to make it work right. And we can go out and ask for competitors to play in that environment and, uh, 
and as long as we do a good job with those requirements, I think we'll, we'll end up with a better product. Um, <clears throat> on a pile on that the standardization part of FCS was probably one of the successes. So something like, say, the SCA was actually a decent success there. Um, in a true model-based acquisition regime where you even have modeled the behavior, right, then, and you establish the correctness of those models all the way down to the code, then you can ask yourself, do they actually match the requirements? And then you can either adjust your requirements or you can adjust your, your system. And FCS tried to do a lot of things in a world where, again, there were, there were mismatched assumptions and expectations between people at various levels uh, in the acquisition system from requirements all the way down to the developer. And hopefully we'll make that much more transparent and make sure that the assumptions are better aligned. Otto Kreischer of uh, Seat Power Magazine. Uh, the one question I have is you're developing your software model program separate from the platform developers. Somewhere or another, it all has to come together. Mission systems have to tie in with operating systems and you know, to make the airplane, the aircraft fly. You know, uh, is there any problem that what you're doing is somewhere when you get to actually marry this together with, with the, the platform itself, there, there could be glitches? Or is this flexible model which you're building compatible enough so that it, you know, it, it can merge right in with the, the platform? You're absolutely right. Obviously, there's, there's connectivity there that has to be, has to be made. There was a deliberate decision um, at the beginning of the JMR program not to uh, build the architecture onto the air platforms. Um, you know, the backbone in, uh, of what we're building, if you will, is uh, simply demonstrators to demonstrate certain new configurations that give us new performance regimes that we can go after and what does that look like. But as Rob said, we're not defining the architecture to a product solution, right? The architecture work that's going on and what you're hearing here is, is in fact flexible enough to be you know, leveraged at some level to the current fleet, to other ground and sea-based systems, and certainly the family of future vertical lift at large. So we're not defining it to a product solution. The, uh, the, the, the connectivity there is really amongst the people that are working it. So, so uh, and I say that to say that we're not all separated. So, uh, so the air vehicle piece is still under my program in total as, as well as the architecture piece. So the demonstrations of everything that's going on is actually one consolidated team uh, working together. Okay. Yeah, I really appreciate the question too. Um, as one of the key reasons why, um, you know, Sikorsky Boeing, we're, we're building in the air vehicle, and you, you hit it, you, you hit the nail on the head. That is a key issue. That's why it's a priority for us to work this part, because we know some of those things are going to come through. And um, as a follow-on to what I spoke about earlier, and a tighter integration between uh, the flight controls and the mission systems, that particular aspect, I think, even sensitizes us to what you're asking even more so. So... Um, we're in it for the long run, um, and we want to really understand what that connection is because there could be some surprises there that we're not aware of right now, um, and, but, and they need to be addressed. Uh, and we need to see how far we can push uh, this technology beyond the conventional sense of what a mission system actually is to, to make some of those things happen. I think from a technical perspective, uh, the most Im I'll assert that the most important thing in doing that is understanding the timing. So writ large, your question is about what in many circles is called cyber-physical systems, where you've got control loops that are connected to physical actuators uh, in a very tightly coupled fashion. So model-based development doesn't remove the need for sound engineering judgment. And if for whatever reason, cost, programmatics, you've decided to separate the two, you, you have to be able to understand when the two are ready to attempt to put back together and test. And again, the claim is that if you understand the timing, in other words, the latency, the sense of time, the timing and the fine grain timing that you need in order to then operate a very tightly coupled uh, control system for the aircraft platform, if you understand that and you understand the physics behind it and the electronics behind it at the same time, you stand a good chance of putting those together and having a successful demo or at least being close enough where you can uh, you know, kind of adjust the mark. Dan, if I could ask, you you just mentioned that uh, face, in theory, could be applied in in any number of different capability areas. Um, Robert, is that, are there plans to 
demonstrate it in other, um, for other types of, of platforms, or is it, we're gonna evolve it in the FVL context, and what, what, what's the anticipation of the way going forward? Uh, so there's multiple um, actual acquisitions that are using the FACE mm -hmm. standard. Uh, C-130T, mm -hmm. uh, avionics obsolescence upgrade, which is a, a cockpit for the uh, C-130T in the Navy. Um, AV-8B for its R&P, R-NAV requirements, which is uh, civil airspace mandates. Um, and then I, I believe uh, uh, H-60 uh, Victor uh, also had a requirement for FACE. So, so it's not um, only uh, new platforms that can benefit from it, but also legacy platforms. As long as we uh, come up with good uh, sound engineering uh, uh, judgments on how we cut it into those platforms. So, so we do analysis up front of how we're actually going to do that. Do we make wholesale cuts or do we just uh, tie it in little bits at a time? Absolutely. So, so uh, both services have uh, already signed up that FACE is the future. So as we look for any kind of modifications and upgrades to our current fleet, in the uh, Army aviation uh, arena, the intent is to make them face compliant. Now, the challenge there, obviously, is you're, you're only doing pieces and parts of that current system. And again, based on the business practice and the acquisition process that you've used to get to that point, it constrains how far you can implement. So again, I go back to the point of, it's, it's exactly the same thing with the model-based tooling. So certainly, if we're gonna do new, uh, software development on an air platform of the future, we are looking to utilize those tools in that process. But those tools are semi-mature today and they will continue to mature over time. And we will mature them through the fast, the fast learn process that we're trying to implement right now under JMR. And at some point, obviously, at whatever point, a current fleet upgrade is done or a future vertical lift is initiated, the maturation of those and the ability to implement those will be a little different, right? You, you just won't, you won't be able to implement it fully on a, on a current aircraft as you would a new platform that you designed from the ground up for that purpose. This may, may not apply to where we're at on this thing now, but in software, there's been a problem in the past of proprietary interest. You know, you develop a software, and the government wants to have it so they can use it for whatever they want it. In, in the future. You're developing a, a model that will, will be used for a lot of different things. Is, is there going to be a problem somewhere down the line between this end of the, those, the two ends of the table in the middle as to uh, who owns what you've developed? Can I kick it off from the government side and then I'll turn it over to you? Uh, so we're trying to be uh, very careful in what we do in all of our standardization uh, practices and all the standards that we develop that we respect the industrial basis need for intellectual property. Um, we're not asking within these standards or even within the functional decomposition for all of the intellectual property. We're looking at what the interfaces are and what the interfaces, how the interfaces behave. The intellectual property can still live in those components that are defined in the different layers of the uh, um, of the software, uh, and it gives the government the ability to either uh, license that software, those algorithms, replace them down the road, compete them. Um, it, it provides a way for us to break down vendor lock, but also allow vendors to keep their IP. So where uh, traditionally, when we try to break down vendor lock, we went after at least a minimum of government purpose rights for everything. I think there's a different uh, acquisition strategy that, and data rights strategy that we're, we're trying to go after, and that's um, if we need GPR, then we'll, we'll ask for that. If we, if we think that we need uh, to just license it so we can compete it later, we'll do that. So we're gonna look at a holistic approach for data rights strategy going forward. Yeah, we, and we have, um, actually, maybe it's our opinion is not so far off, at least from the Sikorsky Boeing perspective. We're, we're OEMs. Uh, we build aircraft, principally. On some of those aircraft, we, we um, integrate the mission systems and write the software. Others, we don't. So we're, we're very also familiar with the vendor lock um, issue. 
And so we're also looking for ideas on dealing with our suppliers as well, that they're the same way our, our customer, in this case, is looking at it. So I think we're in, in a shared journey on that point. I think we realize uh, from industry, and we'll hear from others maybe, I'm just going to speak from our perspective, that we recognize the move towards open systems. We know there's no sense trying to try and take some IP at the uh, uh, infrastructure or the um, data I.O. level, the standard level. We expect our, our customers are going to define those standards. We expect they're going to use commercial standards as much as possible as well. I mean, we've seen pure military standards that don't work. So we, we, we know they're heading in the right direction. That's a good thing. Um, there might be cases, like Rob said, where we would have some IP um, in the heart of the algorithms, the best algorithm that can do certain things that we spent, you know, billions of dollars testing and proving that it works. In those cases, you probably want to let us have the IP because it gives the warfighter something they can't get anywhere else. That might be a case where you'd have something there at the heart of it, but you're not taking any IP for the infrastructure and the services that go around it. Um, other things, and we are looking at uh, other ways to find IP associated with this whole process that makes industry more competitive. Maybe it's in the back-end tools. Maybe we share, uh, there's a common language for sharing models, for example, yet we have one set of tools, our competitors have a different set of tools, and we're competing over cost and whose tools work better, uh, who's got a better set of test cases, who can generate test cases better and quicker and faster. There's a lot of different ways where you can find IP, and I'm not saying I know the answer right now. Um, but we recognize the trend in the open area, and I think we're also sensitive to the same um, issues of vendor lock, and we want to help solve that as well. So I think from Honeywell's perspective, and, and again, we're more of a component avionics supplier in general. I mean, sometimes we've, we've you know, crept up into the integration. But also, I think that there's nothing in the standard or the model base that keeps us from maintaining our IP positions. Um, there are places where, you know, we've developed things out of commercial aviation or whatever that absolutely we're going to maintain, and the standards, you know, provide that interface that, that um, we can deliver to. We may have to um, get agreement on what level the interface will go down to so that we protect our, if you will, business interests, but the, the standard itself should not um, provide any, you know, obstacle to that. That being said, I mean, I think there does still need to be and, and continues to be, you know, growth on the industry government side on on understanding that commerciality and, and offering up, um, you know, industry to provide their commercial solution in a licensed form. And that's really what we're trying to demonstrate under the iterations under joint multiple, right? So standards not going to define that. But the acquisition process and the implementation of that to get after the vision of, in this case, future vertical lift, is what we're trying to learn over the next five years. Um, can I pull the thread on that a little bit? Because, Robert, I think um, what I heard you describe is, at, at least at, at first blush, um, consistent with sort of the more nuanced approach that um, I think Frank Kendall has talked about being necessary and that they're might have been some overreaction uh, one way or the other to better buying by our 2.0. And now, anyway, I think he's acknowledged that uh, sometimes the two sides talk past each other. And, and so I, I, as I was listening to you talk, I was wondering uh, the degree to which you think your uh, understanding of this is influenced by your time in industry. Uh, I think it, the concepts and uh, the data rights strategy in my thinking is very much influenced from uh, my time in industry because I, I didn't work on just DOD, um, necessarily US DOD platforms, mm -hmm. but I worked on for military sales as well. And uh, so when I look at the two um, DOD or, or government and industry, um, how industry makes money, they're reporting to their shareholders, then the, the folks get. Um, uh, bonuses off of that, that's what drives their, their company. Um, with, with the data rights piece, we had to be able to retain IP so that way we could then resell it um, to, to other uh, countries, uh, you know, other um, customers. It, within the government, um, we need to, to do better at looking at what we actually want. Do we want innovation? If we want innovation, then we need to allow uh, industry to invest uh, IRAD and retain the IP for that. If we want competition, then um, 
us paying for the data rights up front and paying huge and investing in those doesn't really drive competition. It's the ability to replace those in the future. If we spend all our money up front on that, we're not going to be able to even recompete it. So uh, I think we need to look at that. So the affordability um, versus um, profits. I think we need to look at what drives industry and then what drives us and then correlate those together in, in, in uh, devising our data rights approach. Um, to further follow this a little bit, Dan, I want to ask you about one of the other elements of uh, the FEL effort writ large is, is um, the piece where you are asking industry to invest a significant amount of their own capital on both in both lines of effort. Um, can you offer some commentary now, some partially down the road on this, about some of the lessons learned in that regard, the degree to which you think uh, the kinds of things that you're doing in FEL uh, are generalizable across uh, more broadly? And sort of where are we in that uh, finding the right balance? So it is a balance. That, that's correct. Uh, I, I, I would say that um, you know, my read of, of the industrial uh, base would say that industry is very concerned, as is DOD, that uh, that our future of vertical lift is on a on a on a ledge. So we've got um, a lot of modernization programs that have been ongoing for some time, um, and those are in production or assembly, and they come to a end here soon. And I say soon in the relative terms from an acquisition timeline, and uh, and the life um, of those aircraft is getting quite old. So, so we haven't put new aircraft in the fleet, brand new aircraft in the fleet for some time. So uh, we haven't done a lot of this work in a very long time. We've been doing, uh, you know, major upgrades. We've been doing that very well. But we haven't done new designed aircraft in a long, long time. So uh, all of us need to, uh, to, to spin ourselves back up on that. And so I believe industry is on board with that. I, I think that's the indication of why they're willing to invest so heavily. Um, but I do know that um, industry looks at it from both sides. So um, of course, future vertical lift is not a given at this point. But honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in my mind the most efficient and, and the most affordable path forward. And I believe industry sees that. But industry is leveraging in what we're doing across the board, whether it's the architecture piece or whether it's the air vehicle piece, so that they can, uh, they can use that in our current fleet to maintain relevancy until future vertical lift comes about, or if future vertical lift is, is on pause again for some period of time for, for a next generation uh, fleet, then our current fleet will have to be maintained. So I, I believe that's, uh, that's motivated within industry. I believe that that's what's uh, bringing their, their investments to the table. And uh, it's really relevant regardless. It's, just, it's really down to a question of efficiencies. What's the most efficient and affordable method to go forward? So I'll, I'll branch just quickly into saying that, therefore, we're doing a business case analysis under Future Vertical Lift. We are trying to uh, bring together all of the elements of the Future Vertical Lift community, and we're trying to articulate, and uh, the intent is to, to have a product late next year, a business case analysis that looks at how many of these are applicable to the current fleet, what levels, what that looks like from an implementation and affordability perspective, and what a future vertical lift in comparison would be. So really establishing the, the groundwork for what would be an analysis of alternatives when we kick off a future vertical lift program. So, so we're looking to, to make the case, if you will, and I uh, believe the case is going to be pretty solid when we get to that point, but uh, proof's in the pudding, so we'll, we'll get there. Hi, uh, CW2 Andrew Wickland, Wisconsin Army National Guard, H-60 pilot, test pilot. Um, these complex systems that you're talking about, especially fiber optics, uh, things like that, waves of the future, uh, my question involves how do you anticipate uh, the services will train and maintain qualified personnel, retain them in their service after they've been trained? And then uh, will the services instead maybe rely on a more robust contractor or civilian force, particularly in a deployed or adverse environment? Thank you. So I don't think I can address the use of contractor support in the maintenance role deployed. Right? I think that that historically that's come up as uh, as an alternative 
um, largely in, uh, in the face of affordability. Um, I don't think we're looking at enabling uh, that sort of support as much as we are looking at uh, commonality uh, across the board as a concept that enables uh, reduction in cost and in, in all of the, um, I'll call them derived requirements for the purpose of this discussion, right? If I have a certain level of uh, common components, in theory, uh, I reduce my logistics footprint. I train a smaller cadre of folks that are qualified to, to work on that system, right? If I can align that across the services uh, through operational concepts, through policy, through um, concepts of deployment, uh, I should realize some measure of savings, right, in, in operations. Um, that's one of the things that we're looking at through the business case that, that Dan just discussed, specifically in the areas of training and, uh, and through common, and in common software and also in maintainability. Um, I think what we've seen historically is that we do achieve some level, some level of, uh, of cost savings by implementing uh, a level of commonality across a family of systems. Um, there, there's a reason that the Navy's flying Hornets, Hawks, and, uh, and E-2s off the carriers, right? Uh, I've got a common cockpit in both, of those, in both of my series aircraft. They both operate off the same ship, and, and I'm running the same code. Um, my maintainers in those squadrons are trained similarly, right? But they're deployed in different squadrons. So um, through a simple memorandum of agreement, uh, a mech on one aircraft can work on the other squadron's aircraft. Um, we're talking about complex systems. No doubt that the guys coming out of boot camp are gonna go to a schoolhouse that are trained on those complex systems, right? Um, something that was mentioned earlier was uh, the fact that one of the most junior engineers at the company is the guy that's kind of leading the charge in, in coding uh, using the new standards. Um, we've got academia partnerships through the consortiums that I think are building those up. Um, I think the, the push for science, technology, engineering, mathematics through the high schools is gonna enable uh, the support that you're alluding to to support our forces, but it's gotta happen. Um, I'll add that as a, uh, ages ago I was a tracked vehicle mechanic in the National Guard. Uh, today I sit on the Senior Steering Group for Engineered and Resilient Systems. And one of the things that model-based design will get you to allow you to do is be able to model what the maintenance will look like. Okay? And so modeling not just the system but also the costs that go into the sustainment tail are critically important to the department. Uh, to keep things under control, and also to make to project what skills we're going to need. And so your point is very well taken. Last question in the back, back there. So the last question is from a French major, <laughs> Don Klein, Elbit Systems of America. I'd actually like to go back to Dr. May's opening statement about culture and cultural changes. And generally people, although we'd like them to be altruistic, don't do things of their own volition. So. From a, from a positive carrot perspective, how do you intend to inculcate cultural change? You know, recognizing that obviously DOD, even within services, has its own cultures. Then we go to industry, and even within the industry, we talk about wanting plug and play capability, but the industry that develops that plug and play has a very different culture than the aerospace industry. I know it's a very nebulous question, but you know, it's ultimately one that if you want to see the full vision implemented, you're going to have to get the buy-in across the uh, enterprise. So I, I just ask that as a last question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I sit in the research directorate, and so I, I don't own acquisition policy or even systems engineering in any way. Okay. Uh, so what I will do is I will advocate for better buying power 3.0. And I think if you look for better buying, through Better Buying Power 3.0 and you ask yourself, do the things that are in there, do they make sense? Right? And I think they do. I, it's hard to find somebody who, who looks at something and argues, oh, this is a bad idea. I mean, it, it, they, they're, they're, it's a list of things that just make sense. And I think your real question is, is how, how do we get that to our program managers and how do we get to that to the people who are the implementers? Right. And I think that that's just a matter of, of really trying to take value to heart 
as a, as a, as a government person. I, I do have things that I am uh, in charge of, you know, I have the research programs, but I try to look in there and ask, am I really getting the value? And I think if we start to teach the new processes, so in, in, our, in our case, there's like open systems architecture, there's uh, intellectual property plans, data rights plans, right? Let's make sure that we seriously emphasize these, say, at DAU, for example. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a leadership um, function to translate BBP 3.0 and get it transmitted down to the workforce. So, so I think um, from my time in industry, I think industry is fairly well, even in the aviation side, uh, fairly well positioned. I think each of the companies already have a culture of product line approaches, uh, reuse across their product lines. Uh, in, in, um, they were driven that way uh, to, to increase profits. And we should also take that same look at it as how are we going to increase the affordability of our systems? Uh, so if that's really what we want to look at, that's kind of the, the same type of cultural change. And I think we're seeing a push uh, from our leadership. They're getting more on board and pushing down. Instead of it being a bottoms-up push, now we have more of a tops-down push. Um, uh, Dan uh, quoted Vice Admiral Dunaway. He's a, a huge advocate of this. Um, by, if, if you haven't seen the article that's out there, he, there's many different quotes in there. Uh, so at Nav Air, there's, there's a huge push uh, on affordability, um, and uh, open architecture and where we go from there. So that's, that's helping change the culture there, at least at that Cisco. Anybody else? You want to talk about the industry side? Okay. Um, on, on a culture side, um, you know, we have, I'm trying to think of it in terms of a combination of skill and culture, and we have silos. So um, they all kind of mesh together. So there is definite cultural resistance to more integration between flight controls and traditional mission systems. That's a barrier we got to get over at some point, I believe, if you're going to make some of these innovative requirements a reality. That's one. Another one is the whole method of systems engineering and software development. We have to get away from doors and these long text-based requirements documents and ICDs and think more models and formal methods for example, uh, and there are organizations whose life is dedicated to maintaining the door system, producing artifacts in a certain form and structure, maybe to the extent that there's a stepwise way of getting into it to auto-generate some of those things might be a small step towards trying to deal with some of those issues, but the cultural boundaries are these um, traditional legacy organizations that plain old simply don't want to go away um, because that's the way they've done it before and that's the way it's worked before. and and this is a big change. So it is a big change going from structural decomposition to object-based and model-based, you know. So we're seeing it. We, we, it's going to take some time. Uh, that's the best thing I can tell you on that point. But I, I, think, I think people are recognizing that it, that is the right way to go. So it's best I can help on that cultural one. Okay. Well, thanks so much to all of you for coming and for all of you for coming as well. Uh, we are hoping to have our next FVL-focused event in December on uh, with, with a panel of naval, uh, Navy staff representatives talking about Navy, Navy future rotorcraft requirements. So more to follow on that as soon as we know it. Um, and then, of course, we'll have a new agenda for FVL events in 2015. So all kinds of FVL excitement to look forward to. Uh, again, thanks very much to all of you very much for taking the time to come and for your insights. Appreciate it.